let's have a look at pulmonary edema and what that looks like. So first, just a little reminder of the anatomy in the lungs. Remember that we have these alveoli, and these are these little air sacs where we breathe oxygen in. The oxygen leave the, leaves those air sacs and goes out into our bloodstream, and carbon dioxide comes to that alveoli. The carbon dioxide leaves our bloodstream, goes into the alveoli, and then we exhale that, ox that carbon dioxide out through the bronchioles and the bronchi and the trachea and all that. Same thing, oxygen's going the opposite direction. We breathe in the oxygen, it goes through the trachea and the bronchi and the bronchioles and eventually gets to these alveoli where it can go out and get into the blood. So if we look a little bit more specifically at this, we will notice that the alveoli are actually, you know, they're not, you know, infinitely thin. They have a little bit of thickness to them. So if we want to look at those alveoli, we'll actually see they have these surrounding tissues that go around the alveoli. The alveoli are made of this kind of really thin tissue. And then furthermore, on the outer layer of that tissue, we have all of our, our capillaries laying there. So we have, we have these capillaries that are dropping off the carbon dioxide and picking up the oxygen from what we're breathing in and out through this alveoli. So Okay, so what happens when we have pulmonary edema when it's not a healthy lung? So again, we have this we have this layer um, that's lined with these capillaries, ready to pick up that oxygen and ready to drop off that carbon dioxide. But so what is pulmonary edema? Well, pulmonary edema is when this tissue that makes up the alveoli actually starts to swell up and fill with fluid. Remember, edema is fluid. Pulmonary edema means fluid in the lung tissues. So when we have this fluid here. So that kind of poses us a little bit of problem. What's the problem? So if we zoom in, so we're going to zoom in to kind of a little area right here where we can see what's happening. And when we zoom in, we'll see that as that oxygen is trying to leave that alveoli and get to those capillaries, now we have this barrier. We have this, uh, this fluid that's filling that tissue. So instead of a tiny little thin layer of that alveoli, kind of like skin that I think of it as, now it's kind of puffed up and it's full of fluid. So now the oxygen can't really easily diffuse across that alveolar wall. It actually has to pass through a layer of water to get to those capillaries. And similarly, the carbon dioxide has to pass through that same water to get into the alveoli so it can be exhaled. So this causes a major problem with breathing because now those gases have to pass through water to get between our alveoli and our, our, alveoli and our capillaries. So what causes pulmonary edema? Well, heart failure is the most common cause. So remember back to our diagrams from chapter six, our blood goes, comes into our right, the right side of our heart, and it has uh, less oxygen and more carbon dioxide. Then we pump that blood over to our lungs. In our lungs, we pick up the oxygen, the then the blood goes back to the left side of the heart and then back out to the body and then drops off all that oxygen, picks up all that carbon dioxide and then returns back to the right side of the heart. Well, when this system fails, we get fluid back up into the lungs. Specifically, when the left side of the heart fails, we still have the right side pumping plenty of fluid to the lungs. But the left side of the heart now is not able to pull that fluid out of the lungs as quickly. So if the left side of the heart fails, we'll get fluid backing up into that lung tissue. And that's the most common cause of pulmonary edema. We'll learn more about this in the cardiovascular chapter, um, but we, all, we often call this congestive heart failure or CHF. Congestive heart failure is basically pulmonary edema caused by left-sided heart failure. So congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema can almost be used interchangeably, but there are some other causes of pulmonary edema. For example, certain poisonings, um, especially inhaled poisons like smoke inhalation, as it damages the lung tissue, it can cause pulmonary edema, but also breathing in epoxies and things like that. Any, any kind of poisoning can cause that uh, pulmonary edema. Also high altitude, they call it HAPE, high altitude pulmonary edema. If someone climbs Mount Everest and they go up too quickly and their body doesn't have time to adapt, they'll get extra fluid that settles in their lungs and causes high altitude pulmonary edema. And then blast injuries, if somebody's near an explosion and their lung basically pops, and you can imagine there's gonna be a lot of fluid build up there trying to repair that lung tissue, that can cause pulmonary edema. So make sure you know all these parts of the blood flow, but we're, we're past that now. So I just wanted to remind you of that mechanism. So what are the symptoms? Well, when they have this fluid, they're going to have a hard time breathing. So dyspnea, remember, is difficulty breathing. That's a common sign or symptom of, of pulmonary edema. Uh, to account for that, they'll usually be breathing rapid and shallow. They can't move much air because their lungs are so full of fluid, so their, their breaths are more shallow. But to make up for that, they're going to breathe rapidly. 
if you listen you to their lung sounds, if you auscultate lung sounds, you'll probably hear crackles, but it'll definitely be wet lung sounds, crackles, those kind of things will have low oxygen saturation because, again, that oxygen is having a hard time leaving those alveoli and getting into the bloodstream. So our oxygen saturation is going to be way down. The patient might even tell you, I feel like I'm drowning. And that, that tells you they feel like they have that fluid in their lungs. That's a telltale sign of pulmonary edema. Um, the other thing is sometimes when they lay flat, it gets worse. So you can imagine if the fluid's kind of at the bottom of your lungs and it's in a smaller surface area, but as they lay flat, that fluid's going to spread out and they'll have a difficult, more difficult time breathing when laying down. So when they lay down to sleep at night, they might wake them up because they're short of breath, that kind of thing. In later stage pulmonary edema, we'll start to see this pink frothy sputum at the mouth and nose. So remember, here's pulmonary edema. We have this fluid all surrounding the alveoli, out, out in the tissue of the alveoli. But in later stages, it progresses. That fluid will actually, as it gets under high pressure and there's nowhere for the fluid to go, it'll actually start to fill the alveoli. So then when the person's trying to exhale, they'll have this pink frothy sputum that's, that is basically because of that fluid that's gotten into the alveoli. So um, when you're thinking of, you know, distinguishing between different respiratory emergencies, Pink frothy sputum at the mouth and or the nose is a telltale sign of pulmonary edema. Really common sign of that. Okay, what do we do to treat it? Well, they need help getting oxygen. So we got to give them oxygen. At a bare minimum, they definitely are going to need a non-rebreather at 15 liters per minute, that high flow oxygen, so that each breath of air they bring in will be higher, have a higher concentration of oxygen. So there are more oxygen molecules, so they'll have a better chance of getting through that water layer to get out into the bloodstream. Ideally, we'd go with CPAP. Remember, CPAP is going to give them 100% oxygen, but not only that, it's going to forcefully push that air continuously into their lungs, continuous positive airway pressure. So it's going to constantly force that oxygen into those alveoli. It's going to hold those alveoli open, but also that fluid, if it's le started to leak into the alveoli, it's going to push that fluid out of those alveoli and back out into those tissues where it's supposed to be. So, and then furthermore, it's going to you know, when you when you inhale and you have that oxygen there, we're waiting for that passive process for those oxygen molecules to just leave the alveoli and go through uh, into the into the bloodstream. But if we have that that water in the way from that pulmonary edema, if that edema is blocking those oxygen molecules from moving, it's going to be a little bit harder. So CPAP doesn't just put the oxygen there and wait for that magic to happen. CPAP actually pushes that oxygen. So we have this forceful pressure. So the oxygen is not just going there and waiting. It's actually getting pushed through that water and push, pushes the water out of the way and pushes the oxygen out into the bloodstream. So if we can use CPAP, definitely want to use that for pulmonary edema. Really uh, a good rule of thumb with CPAP is anytime you're using a bag valve mask, if they're that severe that they need oxygen with a bag valve mask, they need those assisted ventilations, it would always be better to use CPAP as long as it's not contraindicated. So think to yourself, anytime you're using a BVM, think to yourself, could I be using CPAP? And to do that, you just need to go through those contraindications. Remember, we cannot use CPAP if they have low blood pressure because that built up pressure in the chest is going to lower the blood pressure even further as that extra pressure pushes on the heart. We can't use CPAP if they're unable to follow commands. They have to be able to actively exhale against CPAP. So they need to be able to follow our commands. If they're in respiratory arrest, if they're not breathing on their own, we cannot use CPAP because, again, they have to be able to exhale against it. If they have a pneumothorax, so it could be major chest trauma or if you're hearing uh, diminished lung sounds that make you think they have a pneumothorax, Remember, if they have a pneumothorax, that's a hole in their lung. And if we give them CPAP, the air is going to leak out of that hole very fast and inflate, you know, and go out into their chest and their thoracic cavity and start to push on their heart and their other lung and everything. So we cannot use CPAP if they have a pneumothorax. And then lastly, if they have active vomiting or gastrointestinal bleeding that we think might lead to vomiting, we cannot use CPAP because if they vomit with the CPAP on, it's going to push that vomit right back down into their lungs and they're going to aspirate on it. So that's another contraindication for CPAP. Okay, last couple notes about pulmonary edema. Remember, one thing that really trips students up is the difference between all these different illnesses. So pulmonary edema versus pulmonary embolism. They're both PE, so people really get these mixed up. Pulmonary edema, remember, edema is fluid. Edema is fluid buildup or swelling. So pulmonary edema, fluid in the lung tissues. Pulmonary embolism, remember, an embolism is a blood clot or some other kind of blockage. So it could be an air embolism. It'd be an air bubble 
but commonly it's a blood clot. But a pulmonary embolism is something blocking the blood vessels in the lungs. Pulmonary edema is fluid in the tissues of the lungs. So make sure you keep those straight. Then we have all these that all three of these next ones all involve fluid around the lungs, but it's different parts of the lung. So make sure you know these apart. So we know that pneumonia, again, here's one of my bad drawings. So we just have, here's the thoracic cavity and here are our two lungs. I know it's pretty simple, but we'll just keep it simple here. Pneumonia is fluid inside the lungs. When there's fluid inside the lungs, we call that pneumonia. Pulmonary edema is when we have fluid in the lung tissues. Again, like those alveoli. So it's actually in the tissues of the lung itself. And then we have pleural effusion. And that's when we have fluid that's actually out in the thoracic cavity, out in the uh, space between the lungs. A couple other vocabulary words you'll want to know. The fluid in the lung tissue, we call that lung tissue. The technical term for that is the interstitial space. And that's just the space between the cells. But it basically just means in the tissues. It's out between the cells. And then we have the thoracic cavity. We know this is also known as the pleural space. It's the space outside the lungs, between the lungs and the chest wall. And I think that's it. 